Dorothy Demetes. I'm the artist, and my paintings are acrylic. Hi, my name is Rosemary Seppishi Seligman, and this is my husband, Dr. Myron Seligman, PhD. We are owners of Pet Nutritional Science. We manufacture and sell designer antioxidants for cats. The kitty licks will give your cats longevity, will make them live longer, it will make sure that their immune system is the best it can be, and it will give them vitality. Their fur and their eyes will be bright and just wonderful, and they'll give them energy so that they'll be happy and playful for a very long time. Our website is www.pnscience.com. Hi, I'm Mary Bruce, and I'm with Mindful Tales. Um, Mindful Tales is a company that offers Tea Touch to pet owners and new adopters. And I'm also the director of Tavi and Friends, which is a nonprofit group that helps animals through holistic methods such as using Tea Touch. One of our goals with Tavi and Friends is to increase adoptability and hopefully lower the euthanasia rate and the number of animals that come back to the shelters. We also partner with other shelters and rescue groups to uh, train them to use Tea Touch. Tea Touch is a wonderful method for helping to reduce fears, and a lot of behavioral issues are actually stemming from either fears or um, pain. It's touch therapy, and it can help with um, behavioral issues as well as wellness issues. If you think about a clock and starting at the six o'clock position, you're going back around to six and then back up to about eight or nine, and that's your circle in a quarter. You do the circle in one spot and then move to another spot. You wouldn't do it in the same spot. And T-Touch is done slowly. Each circle takes about two to three seconds to complete. And you're only exerting enough pressure on the skin to move the skin. It's not deep. It's a very, very light pressure. Doing things like working on the ears is a good way to calm your animal. It can also help with circulation, respiration, and working on the face a lot helps to calm your animals. Working on different areas of tension, whether it be the hindquarters or the stomach or the mouth, but safety first. They are now doing tea touch actually for people in the healthcare industry to use for pain management, to speed healing, and um, after surgery to help recovery. Jenny Bellin. I have always loved painting cats. I started painting cats for friends and then I started getting commissioned to do cat paintings for people I didn't know. I was the manager of a Revolutionary War battlefield in Stony Point, so we had lots of visitors. And one day, I was about to tell this person that this was not the museum, it was a private residence. She turned around and I saw she was holding something in a small basket. And it was this ball of orange fur, very afraid, very distressed, because its fate was now in the hands of strangers for good or ill. And I'm allergic to cats, I have to tell you. And my wife had come to the door and she was already prepared to reject the cat because she knew about my allergies. But I took one look at those baby blue eyes and I said, we'll take him. We called him Junior, we called him Fuzzball, and we thought nobody should do that to a cat. So we named Cato because the first three letters, of course, are cat. Stony Point refers to the geographical location and Whisker Club refers to the only two members of that very exclusive organization my cat and myself. As you can see from my appearance, I am qualified to be a member of the Whisker Club, and he was eminently qualified as well. We had a secret paw shake and a secret meow, which of course I cannot reveal. It was the best club I've ever joined. I became accustomed to him, he rapidly became accustomed to me, and we became very good friends. Cato's idea was that I should donate the profits to animal shelters. There are a lot of shelters out there and a lot of animals who need all the help they can get, and if I can assist in some small way, 
I'm glad to do it. Jack is about a year and a half, and he has a wonderful disposition, an absolutely wonderful cat. He's a rag doll, a blue color point. Look at those eyes. And he's a Supreme Grand Champion. I'm going to, I think it's ring five. <laughs> Pet bereavement is certainly not an easy thing to talk about, and it's an even harder thing to think about. People are always so amazed at the intensity of the grief that they feel with the loss of a pet. So that's why I started Cherish Pets, and it's a very unique and individualized service. My background and training is as a therapist. I went on to get some credentialing from the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement, so I'm a certified pet bereavement counselor. I work with veterinarians, I work with people that find out about me, and I will assist people with that whole bereavement process. All of the veterinarians do not receive bereavement training in school. They really work on keeping the pets alive. I sustained the loss of my calico for 14 years and I wanted to get another calico. So I went to the Humane Society and said I really would like to adopt a calico. And she said, well, you know, I have only one and this one is a very unique one. And there she was sitting on the desk next to her in this big cage that said, warning, I bite, I'm very nasty. So I thought, well, okay. And she proceeded to tell me the story. She started off her life thrown in a burlap sack with her brothers and sisters and was drowned. And there was a note on the bag that said, the only good cat is a dead cat. When they were disposing of the bodies, she was still breathing. So she resuscitated her, gave her mouth to mouth, resuscitated the newborn kitten. So I opened up the cage and it was a cold day, I remember, and I had a coat on and I thought I'll be safe. And I kind of pulled my sleeves down so I didn't get scratched if she bit me. And she came to me and she came right in here and she nuzzled in and the lady started crying and said, that's it, she's found her mom. I was mother to that cat for 18 years and she was really like my child. This was our last Christmas together. I remember Andrea Bocelli was on TV that evening doing a holiday um, concert and she was failing and getting on in age and you know a little fragile. When I had her, I was dating an undertaker. He would say to me, you know, you need to prepare yourself. Lovey can't live forever, you need to prepare. And I would get so angry at him. I wouldn't want to hear it. My family, same thing. They were worried about me. They were like, you know, you're very connected to this cat. When it was time for me to part and to say goodbye, that it was probably the most difficult thing I ever had to do was to make that decision that our time was coming to a close on this earth. I asked my veterinarian, what will happen to her. He shared with me a practice that unfortunately many of the veterinarians in the United States have freezers in their basement or downstairs and they will put the pets in a body bag or a garbage bag and then every so often these companies will come and they will take all the pets away um, in a truck and they will have them cremated kind of industrial big-sized crematoriums and then return the cremains back to the vet clinic. 
and that just definitely did not work for me. And I interviewed crematories and all sorts of places to try and find what I thought was a suitable place and a suitable way to dispose of her so that I could be with her, so that I would be reassured and guaranteed that that would be her that would be coming back to me. She hated to go to the veterinarian office, so we had a beautiful euthanasia at home in her bed, and then I did find the crematory, and I had her cremated and took her home with me 45 minutes later, and it was very reassuring to me to know that indeed that was her. We've heard of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the whole issue with death and dying and how people go through stages and there's denial and there's anger and there's grief and there's shock. There's all of the stages that we go through. The same with human beings, the same with pets. Many of my clients, more so I think than for humans, it is an intensely personal and very unique experience. Each one of us grieves very differently. Initially you may have the tears, which is great to let the tears flow, but you might think that you're over it and then maybe six months, a year, you never know. Something might hit you, it might strike you and you're like, what's wrong with me? And I'll use my own example. Lovey died on Good Friday and that was two years ago. I had a very difficult time. I couldn't go to work for a few days. I went to work after a few days and found that people that I thought were my friends and colleagues and supporters could not support me. Many people have a difficult time dealing with death and they don't know what to say. And some of the comments that were made maybe really didn't seem supportive. If anything, they almost turned me off or made me feel worse. So I went through my period and I had my crying and I got better. I thought I was okay. It got to be about mid-December and my boyfriend at the time was very concerned. He said, Joe, I don't know what's wrong with you. And I couldn't pinpoint it. I just thought that I was busy. I felt like I was normal. It wasn't that I was thinking about her, but I just didn't know something was really wrong with me and I wasn't feeling, you know, top of my game. So one morning I woke up and I felt very overwhelmed and I was really hysterically crying and I didn't know what it was and then something told me to go and look at her photo albums and when I did then the tears really flowed and I realized and it was like someone hitting me over the head for the first time ever all of the pictures in these amazing amounts of photo albums that I had pretty much 90 percent of them were all of her at the holiday time at Christmas because Christmas was her time of year. She and I loved Christmas. She loved every part about Christmas. Every, I loved decorating, she loved tearing the tree down. I couldn't believe that eight months after she died, I was depressed and I did not realize it. That unconditional love, they fulfill such a need for us. They rely on us. They really are like our children. I've had some clients that um, really have had, you know, losses years ago and maybe something happened and they have a recent loss and it triggers all of that all over again. One gentleman in particular who recently lost his little dog had been in Vietnam and had experienced some post-traumatic stress disorder because he was a paramedic that would be flown in to where the men had been injured. He had flashbacks as he was going trying to get to the vet that, oh my God, here I am, I can't help this little dog like I couldn't help the men who were fighting in the war and it really brought up a lot for him he had a very difficult time we had to work very closely together should I get another pet many times my families that I work with in my business will say I cannot go through this again absolutely not it's the most painful horrible thing I've ever experienced I actually ran into one of my clients here today two years ago she lost her her cat she came to the table in tears last year and she said I'm not able to do it and I said well you know you will know when you're ready and I'm glad to say she stopped by the table today and she's here and she's adopting a pet but it took her two years two years for her to be ready people know that I'm a support system there for them and that's really what what my mission is splendiferous say that ten times really fast we call her Diffie. She got a third best cat here. She's one years old. Maine Coon Kit, eight months old. Female. It's her first adult cat show. 
There will be a fashion show out. in the outwear cavalcade of costumes. Feline fashion show hosted by designer Carl Reese. They are stretch at a boy, stretch show them how long you are. At a boy. Siamese. He's a seal point Siamese. He's a regional winner. He's a retired show cat. This is an American bobtail. And this is a Carillion bobtail. It's American kitten and Russian cat. <laughs> it's a naturally occurring short tailed breed of cat. They both are. And you can see the difference in the two. I give my cat um, baby food at the show just as positive reinforcement so he knows that he's done something special because he doesn't get it at home, so it's just a special treat just so he knows he's done a good job because I don't think you can really train a cat. I think you can condition a cat to have an appropriate behavior and with the baby food it just makes them feel that much more special so they just get it as a little treat. He's a Bengal. If you take one cat, that means, oh my God, what's going to happen with the other cats? So I asked my sister, could she please find a cat for me? I've had a Siamese since I was in college, so I'm used to that voice. I was speaking at the New York Library on Fifth Avenue, and the cat that I was supposed to bring um, the person, the guardian, got sick, and I had only had Orion for two months. And I said, Orion, it's you. You're the standby. You're going to have to go. So when I got to the library, there were about 120 people sitting there. So I thought, OK, if this is the way Orion wants to stay, I'm going to think like a cat, and I will just hold him. But let me tell you about Orion, because it's an incredible story. He was left at a San Diego shelter in California with a note in his carrier, please give this cat to Siamese Rescue. They do really poorly when they're in a shelter. They scream and they make everybody crazy. And he appeared to be neutered, but he sprayed, he bit, he didn't get along with the other cats and he really smelled. He got 30 baths. He got hormones. Finally, 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 one of the veterinarians looked at his penis and saw that there were little barbs on it and said, aha, he must be cryptorchid, which means that his testicles hadn't descended. They were inside, so they had to go and do an exploratory. So Orion was acting like a tomcat, because he was a tomcat. He would be like this, hanging out like he is now, and then he would give a cry and a hiss, and he would run off, almost like someone was chasing him. I realized that they were panic attacks. I had to move his food to the bathroom. He would eat in the bathroom, but I would have to sit with him, because if I walked out of the bathroom, he would run after me. He had runny eyes, he had asthma, he would have the bronchial cough, and it would just be that long, long cough. And I had had him on cortisone for a bit, and I tried some homeopathic remedies. I played my CD when I was there, I played it when I wasn't there. I took him on speaking engagements, and when he had to do anything with people, it was therapy for him, because in the shelter he was with 20 cats. He was hardly getting any individual attention. What he was going through was post-traumatic stress disorder. He eats in the kitchen now. I may have to sit with him just a little bit, no more asthma, and I find that if I wipe his mouth at, before going to bed at night, he doesn't drool. Now he is emotionally healthy. He has the home where he is the, the only cat. He's an older cat, and he's, he's, you know, he's getting what he needs. I've only been showing since about 2003, but I've been breeding ragdolls for 21 years. And this is the bicolor pattern.
They're a very sweet cat. They don't usually scratch, bite, or climb curtains. Um, you can pick them up and flop them, and they don't care which way you flop them. You can swing them like this. We start about 9 o'clock in the morning and show until about 5. And then on Sunday, we start again at about 9 o'clock in the morning and show until 5. It's a lot of work. I brush it through. The father to this little girl, he came over from Germany. And the girl didn't think that he really wanted to show a whole lot. And then all of a sudden, he just decided he wanted to show. And he did very, very well in the show hall. Um, he was fourth best rag doll in the world in 2003-2004 in Tika. He and I had a bond. We still have that bond. And this is a doll having a stitch in time. You can see her color is considerably darker than the blue bicolor that I had out earlier. But, um, as they get older, then they get darker. She will even get darker with age, and she will grow more. She's just a baby yet. They grow until they're five years old. Starting in October, we go to Lancaster, and then we go to, usually to this one, and then we go to Raleigh, and then we go to three in Cherry Hill, and the Islin one. And then there's one in Reading in February. And then there's another one in Raleigh in February. And then there's also a Christmas City Cat Club in Easton, Pennsylvania that I go to. And then usually in Laurel, Maryland that I go to. I'm Carla Reese, the owner of Meow Wear. I've created a line of ready to wear clothing for cats, collars and costume harnesses. Hale Bob is quite a famous model. Here she's wearing a Halloween devil horns today. We're calling this the beatnik outfit for those of you that remember that trend many years ago. And he's complete with his little glasses to go with it. The hat has asymmetrical holes so the kitty can wear it off to one side. Thank you. 
Max is a good sport. He's here to show off all the fun you can have on Thanksgiving. And we suggest Max is only a centerpiece, not the main horse. <laughs> Here we are with a little kitten sized snowflake outfit, perfect for winter occasions. The skirt is reversible, and it has all kinds of glitter on the overskirt. Very unusual fur coat. It's a two tone faux fur, of course, and it's accented with a crimped fur at the armholes and the neckline. Hi, Alpha, I'm your beautiful. And Amy's costume is complete with a Santa jacket, Aww. a bag of goodies for all the good little kitties, and of course a beard, a fancy hat with ear openings, the spokes cat for nine lives. Morris has helped to rescue over a million unwanted cats, and he's here to spread goodwill with his trainer, Rosa Ordeal. Morris is wearing the Meow Wear tuxedo harness. And they can be visited in Morris's tent at the back of the arena. Please go visit Morris and have your picture taken with him. Our quintessential handsome boy. We all love Morris. I hope you all enjoyed it and took plenty of pictures. And I'd like to thank you for all your attention and mainly to thank all the people at the Westchester Cat Club.